investment in infrastructure development, along with tepid economic growth, threaten to derail the country's much-needed infrastructure development. The government is to invest 847 billion rand in infrastructure over the next three years, but some private sector players have questioned the extent to which that rollout is taking place, as they don't see their books reflecting such projects. But the private sector itself has also been slammed for building up cash piles and not investing in the country's future. Well, to talk about the challenges and opportunities for infrastructure development, I'm joined by Dr. Enina Ngem Abota. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. Okay. Now, every year at budget, uh, over the past few years at least, for my memory, um, you know, you get the finance minister telling us that X number of billions are going to be invested on infrastructure de development. To what extent has that actually played? out on the ground? Uh, well, you said yourself, it hasn't quite happened for a number of reasons. Uh, one is capacity constraints within the bureaucracy itself. Um, the, the bureaucracy is not quite able you know, to push infrastructure spending to the extent that we would want. That's a problem. But there's now another risk with the economy slowing down, not able to post high growth rates. Uh, the fear is that um, less budget might become available in the future, but in particular given um, our needs for social support of the vulnerable. So in that context, it um, is, is, is likely that infrastructure spending would not, uh, well, well, that's the risk, would not speed up uh, the way we would um, want it to do. I want to ask you about yeah. the Presidential Infrastructure Coordinating Commission that was set up a few years ago. Yes. Um, how, has, how effective has that been in, in making things happen on the ground? Well, it was set up to, to coordinate things, to make sure that the bottlenecks are identified and removed and the obstacles and, the, and spending ex expedited. But I would say that, um, well, gains have been made, but a lot more still needs to be done. Um, I think that's what one would say. It's like any public sector initiative. It's not perfect. It's done by human beings. Uh, we do have skills constraints. Uh, we have nine provincial governments. We have the national government. So the, the coordination mechanism could be challenged now and again. But on the whole, I think you see, it looks a lot better now than things were before the committee itself was established. Now, one of so the things... It's a, it's a step in the right direction, I would say. Yeah. Okay. It makes sense to have such a central coordinating committee yeah. to oversee yeah. the infrastructure. It's one of the things the that you've said is that uh, it's very important for the private sector not to just sit back and wait for government. But the problem is, yes. uh, from my understanding, is that yes. a lot of people in the private sector across all sectors say yes. that there's a lack of government policy certainty. And that is why they decide to hold on to cash piles and not invest. So based on that, how can you expect them to invest if, if they don't feel government is being transparent? Well, I think you've, you've answered your own question. Well, everywhere you hear government officials, ministers, politicians, you know, uh, kind of telling the public, pri private sector to invest and saying, well, we are investing, you are not investing, and you have all this money, so you be patriotic. These are platitudes. Uh, I don't think they've amounted to much anywhere. Uh, businessmen listen politely, and, but they go back and carry on as if they had never been spoken to. Because there are imperatives. I, I have never really met a businessman who started a business uh, in order to develop the economy or to create jobs. People start businesses because they want to make profit. If they can make profit, you don't need to lecture them. You don't need to tell them to invest. They will invest. So if they're not investing, it's because they do not think that they would make profits to the level. Well, comparatively speaking, the question is whether they will make more profit here or outside of the country. If they're convinced that they would make more profits outside of the country, they would invest outside of the country, regardless of what you tell them to do. So I really don't think it helps much to preach to them. I think what we should do is to create an environment that makes it worth their while to invest within the country. You talk about policy certainty. Mm. I think it's critical. Business needs to be planned. And it should be long term, because you, you build a plant and you want it to be there for 15, 20, and more years. So there should be policy certainty before you invest, even when the policy is not very, very conducive. If there is certainty around it, then you are more likely to attract investment than you would with 
a more favorable policy, but that is this, it's not really certain. Yes. Now, and there, we, we have had a few of such policies anyway, and there are discussions. We will nationalize the mines. We haven't quite done it, but it's ever there hanging. So people aren't quite sure whether they should come and invest or not. We will take back the land, at least half of it, and give to farmers who've been on the land. I'm not saying that's bad, but we haven't done it. So uh, investors, they, they, they kind of sit and wait and to see what happens. I wanted to ask you if I may interject there. Yes. Um, we know that since 2010, the construction sector has been really struggling. Yes. And it's only maybe this year that we've begun to see some construction confidence indices come up. Yeah, um, picking up a little. Yeah. yeah. How, are, how are we doing in South Africa in terms of the construction industry, regardless of what government well, is doing? Construction has picked up of late. I think it created a number of jobs. In the last statistics, there's a few thousand jobs we have been created within construction. But it has the potential to do a lot more. There are constraints, skills, particularly in the, in the engineering field. We're not producing enough engineers. You really battle to get qualified engineers. Mm -hmm. So that is a problem that the government has to address. But there are no short-term solutions. You don't produce an engineer overnight. But this is where you could, I think the country could use this immigration policy as a way of getting skilled people. If we did this, we wouldn't be the first country to do it. America does it, mm -hmm. Canada does it, Australia does it. Nearly every country uses immigration to get skilled people. Just imagine how many years it takes to train an engineer from matric to actually becoming an engineer would be about 10 years. You get your first degree, your, your degree, you start practicing, you become a professional engineer. When you are really experienced to really be an engineer, uh, well, that should take about 10 years after graduation. And you don't then want to confine yourself to utilizing the resources, skill resources you have within the country only. Uh, what makes sense is to get them internationally. And that's what other countries are doing. Uh, I think uh, that we should go out of our way to seek to recruit, to allow qualified professionals to get into the country because they will be coming here to to help grow the economy. And when the economy grows, it's good for everybody. Indeed it is. Yeah. My last question. Um, the Competition Commission fined some uh, firms in the construction sector. To what extent do you think that action has actually cleaned up the sector so that when the billions do start being spent, <laughs> they're spent properly? Yeah, yeah, the construction sector, as you know, in South Africa is dominated by a few... Well, th there are very many players, but there are a few so-called white companies, if you want to call them that, that are dominant. Mm. And there are also signs of collusion within, within that sector, of collusion identified by the Competition Commission, hence the fine. Um, I think it has helped. The, the self-disclosure they're, they're talking about, kind of forcing companies to come clean before they are cut out and penalized, and the fear they create then is that if you don't come out and the other person comes out, you don't know if two of you collude. You plan to do something illegal. And the Competition Commission, I know they have that program uh, encouraging the first comer who comes to, you know, come clean, mm -hmm. would get lesser penalty or be forgiven. So that creates a problem. So when you have done something with somebody, you don't know whether they go first. You, you know, to come clean. Or so, so you, and that has encouraged more companies, you know, coming up and, co and confessing and getting some leniency according to that policy. Uh, I, I think it has helped. Has it solved the problem completely? No. I know that, I suspect, because I'm a player in this industry, that collusion is still there. There is horizontal coordination. You, you know, the companies coordinate horizontally and therefore able to... Uh, to impose prices that they would otherwise not be able to impose. And they are able, through horizontal coordination as well, keep people out, out of the market. It does happen. Look, it happens in every country. It's not going to go away. But our competition commission is efficient, it's effective. And I think with time, as they grapple with the problem, they will eventually come to a situation where it no longer becomes a, ma a major problem. Currently, my thinking is that it remains a problem. All right, that's where but, we're going but, to... But, but that is not the big problem in the economy. Uh, yeah, I, it's a problem, but I don't think that that is... The, it, it does impede progress, definitely. It does impede progress. And it would help if we solved it. Mm. But I don't think that is the big reason that 
infrastructure spending is not speeding up. It's no, of course. It's, it's, it's one of a myriad of issues that I wanted to cover one. with you. But I agree. I want to thank you very much for your time. That's where we're going to leave it. Thank oh, you well. so much. Thank you very much. Uh, that was Dr. Anina Nke Abonta.